our faculty alumni today are Eunice Maluleke, Chriselda Kekana, who will briefly introduce themselves before they give their candid journey as students who were growing their careers or studying for their careers as um, students at the university and how they uh, journeyed when they were students here, how they journeyed when they joined the alumni of the world or the alumni of the University of Limpopo. We are celebrating your careers and we hope and pray that your topics, the topics that you have chosen, will be able to keep um, our students focused in how they should also forge their careers while they are students. Tiaka with faculty alumni in collaboration, that's in collaboration with the Alumni and Convocation Office. I'm Kihilwe Plaike. I am with the chairperson of the SRC Gender Health and Wellness, Miriam Mabocha, who will be co-presenting this with me. Over to you, Miriam. Uh, good afternoon, um, Ms. Eunice Maluleke, Myra Mulukomi, and uh, Crystal Dakikana. And, uh, the students, of course, uh, the most important people here. My name is Maria Mavocha, as indicated. I am the former deputy president of SRC 2020, 2021, and currently the chairperson of um, Gender, Health and Wellness, 2021-2022. Uh, the reason why, as the SRC, we came with the concept uh, Tiyaka with my faculty alumni was that uh, we give uh, confidence to our female students who are studying uh, in the Faculty of Humanities. Uh, reason being that uh, we have noticed that majority of those in um, humanities uh, it was not their preferred choice initially. They found themselves in the, um, in the programs due to space availability. Therefore, we want to impart some confidence in them and make sure that they know what to do and how to acquire skills while uh, they are still students. So in, in a nutshell, we are trying to prepare them uh, for the um, corporate world. Uh, that's um, why we are here today. Thank you. Ms. Maluleke and Chriselda, you are here going to talk to Faculty of Humanities, students who are from the School of Social Sciences, School of Education and Bachelor of Language and Communication Studies. Who would like to start between the two of you to talk about your journey and uh, the conversations as we, are uh, F, as we have requested should be simple, um, informal, and uh, very candid in order to build our female students at the University of Limpopo, as Miriam has said. Who's going first? Um, between? I think I could start. Over Thank to you, you. ma'am. All right. Um, I'm sorry if you didn't hear that clearly. Um, I was saying, um, like you've heard, my name is Chris Kikana. I come from Bakenberg, uh, which is next to Mukopani, and I did my BA in Media Studies at the University of Limpopo, starting from the year 2013. Um, and I finished in 2015, graduated in 2016. Um, yeah, that's really the bio of who I am. I am currently the editor of Chisa Life, which is the entertainment section on Times Live. Um, and I thought when I was asked to give this talk that I would maybe take you through my journey. Um, 
like most people, media wasn't my first or second or third choice. Uh, but, you know, when it was time to, to register, I got there and there was like, there's no space here and there's no space there. And I ended up in the BA. And I remember going home the first time and the, my grandmother was asking, so what did you register for? And I was like, yeah, something called media studies. I'm not sure what that is. Um, but yeah, I came back and first couple of classes, we had like the Honorable Dr. Kuba, um, Mr. Sinong, Reverend Kusa, and they took us through what we were actually studying. Um, and so the, the simplest way after that that I could explain it to anybody who was asking was, I'm studying the things that the people whose name you see after generation ends or the movie ends, those people whose names you see, they studied what I studied. That's what I, that's how I used to explain it. Um, and as I, as I learned, I, I think I found that I was naturally inclined to it. Um, it is a space that is a bit more well outspoken people. So Renava Ovalela Kudu, we just fit right in most of the time. Um, I had no idea about majors or if I would want to do radio or TV or print. I just knew that I was yeah, here and I was going to rock the hell out of it. So the best advice I got really early, um, I think I concentrated a lot on the academics of things in my first year. Somebody advised me that if you're going to do media studies, it is more than theory and you have to, as soon as you can, build a portfolio. At, back then, I didn't know what that meant, but basically what they were saying was start volunteering in spaces that will help you get better at the skills that you are learning in class. Um, I joined everything that could be joined. I, cho I joined the Poetry um, um, Society, um, the English uh, Writer Society. I was on the committee that was organizing um, the debate conferences. Um, I, I started writing, well, as part of our studies, Mr. Sinung made us write for the departmental newspaper, and I joined Kiyaka, where I started off just writing and then eventually became the session editor. Um, my editor at the time was Mamo Uh And I think that helped me a lot, because by the time I got to my third year and we were doing radio practicals, um, I produced Wings of Love and Wings of Turf, uh, I I was more comfortable in the space. There was nothing that you could ask me that I couldn't do. And I was that girl in class, always doing the presentations. I felt more confident because of the things that I was doing outside um, class. And I started applying in third year. Um, every day I dedicate an hour after class to apply for internships. And I basically started working before I graduated because I got an internship at the Star newspaper, uh, one of the biggest national newspapers um, in South Africa. And I started working, I think in November as an intern. Now, that's part of the journey is where everything got real. First of all, there is two very different sides to journalism if you enter into print. Um, it's not glamorous at all. And I will tell you, and it might be a shocker today, and this was like, I think, five, seven years ago, but my stipend was 2500 And I had to survive on that, make sure that I got, you know, I, I went back and forth to work, that I paid rent wherever I was staying with that money. So you need to keep that in mind that unlike... And unfortunately, unlike the science field where their stipend is 14,000 when they start, 14,000 is going to be your actual salary when you are permanently employed when you start. Um, because you would have started at 2.5, or maybe these days it's like 5,000, but it's really low. And I mean, I would love to tell you that it's changing, but there's still a lot of hurdles um, before that will change, I think. Um, however, in those tough stages, I think I was fueled mostly by my love for journalism. Um, I did a bit of everything when I started. They 
Twitter's layout of how to lay out the newspaper, the writing of headlines, um, photography. And I started at a time where mobile journalism was becoming a thing, um, where we would use our phones to um, 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 capture stories. And we, we were using multimedia more than other people. So I went into the online space quite quickly when I started working. Um, and, you know, I grew from there. So I really want to say that it's it's not easy at all. I think partially I was lucky in that I ended up doing mainly entertainment journalism, which a bit which is a bit more glamorous than hard news or investigative news. And you know, I've met some of my my idols. I've met really like celebs and and, and prominent people that I've always seen on TV. But you get to a point where you get over that and it really is about your work. And in this field specifically, you don't go anywhere if you don't show initiative, which is the exact skill that you start learning in in school, at class, in in the university space. You have to take initiative. You have to be the one saying, hey, something happened down the road. I think it's a story maybe I'll write it and send it to the local newspaper, maybe they'll use it. Um, I think it, taking initiative and persevering when things are not so glamorous is the one thing that uh, will help you make a name for yourself um, in, in this industry. I mean, I've technically been working for about seven, nine years you count Kiaga experience just over a decade. Um, and I'm the youngest, I'm one of the youngest editors in the company that I work for. And I have a lot of other things that I aspire to do. Um, and it has to come from sort of within you because there isn't, it isn't a very encouraging space. Um, there isn't a lot of people who are going to be rooting for you or helping you with this and that. But if you grab onto a, a mentor, um, I found that I was really helped by the fact that my boss was mentoring me, you know, into this is how you write properly. This is how you change a story if, if you are writing it online um, as opposed to if you are writing it for the, the, the you know, the things that you're taught in class they're great and they're great basics. And one of the most important things you'll have to remember with, even today when we are writing stories, we call it journalism 101 is, you know, the, the, the basics of journalism. Why is this a story? What's the public interest? Or um, how accurate is your story? You know, how, how accurate are your facts? Are you verifying this? Are you verifying that? Those things remain important and are really what set us apart from the random people that show up on Twitter and then think they know what journalism is which is why this degree and this qualification remains important if this industry is going to grow in, in, in any way. But you also have to be willing to move with the times. You have to upskill yourself as much as you can. Yes, newspapers still exist. Yes, things are online. But actually, right now, video is at the forefront. If you don't know how to capture your stories um, in terms of images and visuals, you, you you may be at a disadvantage in in you know in in the market field and um in closing i do want to say one very important thing is that there's always a notion or this unspoken thing that people always want to say yeah but it's the people from vets or the people from uj that are going to get the jobs there's no such thing when we get to the field when we apply when we are sending in cvs we are all the same we there's the we are, there's no difference between us and all you have to do is get your chance and then prove yourself prove why you deserve it there's a couple of us here i always run into chris mashile he was in my class he's a film director now you would have seen a couple of his films on zanzi magic and zanzi way to and show max recently um wendy mutata is at the cbc um you know, there's there's just a lot of us. Puti is at Daily Sun. So if you are ever told, why would you study media studies at U University of Limpopo, just tell them 
we are dominating. We are, there's a lot of us out here and we are just as good as anybody else. Uh, it's just important that when you get the opportunity, just prove yourself and run it. Um, I think that's really it. Uh, I'll hold whatever else I have if there are any questions, but that has really been my story. And I mean, at the moment, I am studying for an LLB degree and I'm also doing a post graduate diploma in management, but it's not because I don't have journalism. It's just because as you grow in your career, you draw the map of where you want to be in five, in 10 years, you realize that you need to expand. You need to keep upskilling yourself. Data is becoming the big thing in the media space. So there's always something more to learn. So yeah, that's really it. I'll wait for your questions. An interesting and exciting story to share with the current students, Griselda. Well done. Thank you. Congratulations. And um, we also wish you very well in your future endeavors. I know you'll be able to make a good journalist, especially after you've aced that law degree that you are studying for and the management degree that you are studying for. We will wait for the presentation or the talk yeah, Ms. Uh, Yunus Maduleke, after her, we'll take the questions from the students. Please stay on. Uh, okay. Tiaka, with my faculty alumni. Over to you, faculty alumni, Ms. Yunus Maduleke. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, my dearest. Thank you very much, uh, Griselda. That was beautiful listening to you. And uh, I want to say to you that it is so true that students from Limpopo University are the best in the field. In my area, we are rocking. In my area, they respect us. In my area, you know, they take us seriously because we are dominating and we are doing very well. Thank you, uh, Gihilwe and Tim, for, for inviting me that I share with. Um, prospective alumni of the University of Limpopo. My, unis, my name is Eunice Maduleke. Um, Chriselda, I happen to be a Gekana and I'm married to Maduleke now. And um, my career path is very, very interesting. My trade is social work. And I've established that humanities are actually the foundation of so many careers that once you have done your BA, whether it's in uh, social sciences or in media studies or in education, you've got the foundation of so many careers that are embedded on the BA degree. So I would like to say to all of us, it is, a very, it is very noble, humanities are very noble, and a lot of companies now, the CEOs, whether they've done you know, your engineering or they're into hardcore businesses, whether it's um, accounting business now is pursuing and ensuring that their senior management is equipped in humanities. So that is why I'm saying that it is a foundation of all the careers that you can think of. So it is one of the noble ones. I started as a, as a, as a probation officer working for TPA and is now known as Department of Social Development many months ago. And um, I was doing probation work. That is basically everything that had to do with um, the cases going to court, whether it's adoption, foster care, or um, juveniles, you know, going to juvenile court, or anything that has to do with custody, divorce cases and whatever. So anything that had to do with legislative framework, we were responsible for it. And it was a very, very beautiful you know, time for me because I learned so much about even things around human rights, that social workers were so strong when it comes to legislation so that you cannot do the work if you don't know legislation. So that is why I'm saying that it's very dynamic, it is very diverse, and uh, you need to know 
Then I moved to the East Rail. Um, then I started working for the Tokora City Council. I think I worked for a year and moved to the City Council of Katlehong. Then it was a municipality. I worked until I got trenched. So I was able to have an understanding that some of the things that become, you know, you think that is a head of not knowing that it's actually a stepping stone. Why we got retrenched is that at that time there were, you know, rent boycotts and they wanted to punish us. And uh, they decided to retrench 500 workers out of 800. So I was one of the six workers that were retrenched because they use what we call the LIFO principle that is last in first out. I was the last to be employed in the city council then therefore when they started with the retrenchment I was retrenched and at that time I was armed with my master's degree in social work and here I was very much unemployed and started looking for employment and all the doors looked out closed because I was told that I was overqualified and at that time I was and uh, as a young social worker, you know, you go to different agencies, and at that time, there were private agencies, and you always were not that many. I was told that I was overqualified for a position of just, you know, your junior social work. And, you know, for me, I still had so much energy because I wanted to work, I wanted to pursue, I love the profession. I ended up, you know, moving to. <laughs> I said agency started selling houses. I sold houses, quite a lot of houses, and I honed my interest into you know interior deck, into infrastructure development, etc. It was beautiful selling houses because a social worker you've got so many skills in terms of communication, in terms of training people, and in, in terms of giving people hope. Then as, at some stage, I was also doing voter education for um South African breweries through another chap who got their tender and also working on EAP. I was unemployed, then I went to another company, then I offered my services for employee assistance program. But at that time I didn't like casework. I don't I didn't want to listen to people and their problems were just too many and I was young and they were overwhelming. Then, because I wanted to move back into the profession, I saw a beautiful ad on Sunday Times. They wanted a CEO of Femnet. Femnet was, it was an NGO of Transnet. And they wanted a CEO and they listed all the responsibilities in terms of the problems that needed to be done. That is in the areas of, you know, the elderly, in terms of the disabled, in terms of ECD, all those things that they mentioned, I did them before. So, even though I was not in management, no one would have challenged me when it comes to developmental work because I knew my story. Then I decided to apply to Courage. I applied for that position and I'm told that more than 130 people applied for that position. And I went for an interview. Interesting enough is that when you're a junior worker, you don't have management skills. And because I'm, I was a go-getter, there is an organization known as SAFSA that is an organization of black social workers. I volunteered myself many, many, many years ago and on many occasions, even currently, I'm the treasurer. So I hold my skills in terms of uh, financial management from SAFSA, which is an NGO. I kept their books. At some stage, I was their secretary, then I, I, I polished my writing skills and whatever. So all I'm saying is that when you don't have or you don't get an opportunity at your workspace, you know, to, to manage, there are NGOs or other organizations where you can actually learn the skills. And then when opportunities come, you know where to go. Then I got, needless to say that I got a job at Transnet, not only for Femnet, because it was an NGO, I got a job at Transnet and having to establish what we call that time it was known as um, community involvement. There was absolutely nothing I had to start from scratch. I developed that portfolio. I established what we call a Transnet Foundation. We established what we call this uh, Football School of Excellence. Then we did programs on arts, you know, the mass choirs. 
you know, your cultural color badges of this world, anything that had to do with developmental work, that was my space. When you talk about health, we had uh, your primary health care trainings. Now they've got a third one. When it comes to entrepreneurship, we had to utilize our assets and uh, so that they get used by communities. So it was such a beautiful, beautiful programs that we developed. And, and I was also responsible for what we call a heritage foundation, heritage section of the foundation. We had to run the choo-choo trains in between Georgia and Nysna. I had to run the aeroplanes whereby, you know, we operate in the tourism unit. It was huge. It was massive. Where have you ever heard of a social weather operating an aeroplane and making sure that there is money? So I did that. And, and, and when we continue with that particular programs of community development, it, it was a question of saying that, I was just an ordinary social worker. Then I decided to say that when I was unemployed to say, I want to get an entry into corporate because in, in welfare space, there was nothing for me. I decided to go to that and enroll for what you call educate, higher diploma in education of adults, thinking that I'll go to a corporate, go to HR department, be one of the trainers because social worker again is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a teacher because we've got elements of teaching in it. The very same year, that's when I got the word of transfer, and I said, do I continue with this diploma or do I drop it out? I decided to continue with it. With it. But when I assessed the environment, there were people who were, there was what we call upward mobility of quite a number of people who had just had, you know, ordinary diplomas in PR and marketing. Then I said to myself that I need to have business skills because social work, you don't have those skills. Then I decided to do your PR, I decided to do your marketing and combining, you know, your social work skills with business skills, then I became, you know, unstoppable Tinani. Because you have an understanding of the language on the ground in terms of communities. Then you've got an understanding in terms of the of the employer, what they require, because the employer will want to establish whether you are adding value into the organization or not. So you have to develop those skills that will add value to the organization. I recall when I started the trust that they had a unit where they were doing wellness and quite a number of social workers, they had, to, they were doing wellness. And we know that that's what we call confidentiality. You cannot share with any other person about the issues of the client, et cetera. And, you know, the manager did not understand. And most of them, they ended up falling within HR, doing the recruitment and other things, and less to do with, you know, wellness, counseling, et cetera, simply because the employers could not understand what value were these people adding. So that is why we had a lot of social workers in corporates that are in HR department because by default, I don't know why. So I'm saying to, to, to all of us is that, if you want to move, you need to reskill. If you want to make a difference in your in your in your in your portfolio in your career, there's nothing that is limiting as having skills that are not relevant to 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 the organization. Then I moved to MTN. I was the the head of the foundation as well. And after MTN, I moved out. I established my own company. Um, where I was servicing, I'm servicing quite a lot of companies in terms of wellness, doing EAP for companies, um, and then also doing strategy development in quite a number of companies, and also doing buying and selling import and export. I established my own, what do you call this? You, you love. I established um, a boutique, you know, and clothing boutique. And you ask yourself, a social worker in a clothing boutique, is because when we do counseling, we develop a person, you know, within. You want to 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 create this hope, and you want to, you know, develop a person holistically. And obviously, the outlook was also critical. <laughs> then, I, you know, when I go on holiday, I'll always open my eyes and see what is there. Then I'll end up buying and coming back home, and my ticket will be paid for. So I, I developed that interest, whether you go to Brazil, any place that I go to on holiday, then I'll open my eyes, I'll see business opportunities. So the Brazilian, I was no longer going to Brazil, they'll come to me. 
so that I stock from here, order and bring and whatever I establish that. But that was not because of just opening my eyes. Is that because I decided to do the MBA? I did my second master's degree, I did the MBA, and with that MBA, I decided to do my theme of the dissertation was on value add to all the relevant stakeholders, meaning that whatever you do, it has to add value to the communities that you're targeting, it had to add value to the organization, and also it had to add value to the person or the people that would be implementing those programs. Then I developed uh, the model, you know, to, to talk about sustainable development and whatever, and it really took me places because I was in a position to help quite a lot of organizations in South Africa to set up their foundations because I've done research, I've done research work, and I've tried those models, and the model worked. And, and, and at, at MTN, because they were not selling um, image, unlike Translate, they were selling a product, then because we work with quite a lot of stakeholders, then I had to strengthen my, my grip on stakeholder management. They would never move in terms of going out there to do sales and marketing without without engaging or using our programs you know to get customers etc so that's the value that we're adding so all i'm saying is that whatever environment that you found yourself in ensure that you do research ensure that you have an understanding to say what value am i adding in this in this particular entity once you have done that then you go places and don't wait for for people to develop you you know, you, you need to be eager to know more. You need to be eager to empower yourself. You need to be eager to find out what is happening and what is working and what is not working in your environment. But all I want to say to all of you is that there are quite a lot of opportunities for people who have done the humanities. And um, I took quite a lot, you know, when I was doing these programs, funding these different fields, because as a social worker, you are in the arts and culture, people in the arts and culture, they should not look at it as enter entertainment, they should look at it in, in, as an industry, you know, to, to grow the economy. When you look at, um, you know, the areas around uh, your ECDs and whatever, again, it's another industry. So there are quite a lot of pockets, but what is lacking is people waiting for somebody somewhere to come and develop them. If you wait for other people to come and develop you, you must know that you won't get it. Yeah? Like now, I'm marking, I'm marking for UNISA, and I'm looking at you know, the programs that um, these young ones are going through, um, looking at the curricula and thinking of the curricula that I've done previously, is that there are, there's always a gap in terms of what you have been taught and what is happening in the field. And I've, I've, I've also established that, you know, I know at TEPFLUOP some years ago, I came to do the presentation at the, the social work forum, uh, addressing the students to say where the gaps are in the, in the field. There is no way in which you can cancel an African without using the issues of the spirituality. The starting point to cancel any African person is issues of spirituality because there's somewhere that they belong to. But when you use these books that have been written in England, in Western and whatever, they don't deal with our issues. And the next thing you become, you, you know, you, 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 you get worried to say, what is happening in the environment? People are sick. You know, issues of mental health are very, are very, are very high in, the, in, in, the, in, in South Africa. And that is why we've got the problems of suicide, we've got the, the, the moral fabric of the society also ero being eroded. That is why we need to rebuild the family. And the family is a starting point. The social ills, they emanate from the family. But if we've got families that are misfunctioning, then it won't, it won't work. You know that in terms of social work, and then I know in terms of teaching, and I know in terms of those that have done, you know, library, library we call it information science now, is that, again, you don't have to end up in your in you know traditional industries you can always go other places because if you have done your information science you need to risk yourself in terms of issues around itis and then there you do knowledge management and where do you get it and where do they need more information 
it's, it's, it's in companies, it's in corporates. And the educators as well, they don't have to be in classroom. You know, there are those who remain in classrooms, obviously. But industries, corporates, they want educators. That's what we call e-learning. So when you go to corporates, who is running that are educators. But educators, they think that they have to go in the staff room. But co corporates are actually looking for you. And, and social workers, obviously, they are very versatile when you talk about issues around anthropology, you know, issues around criminology. And there are quite a lot of areas that we can venture into. But it's, it is your take to say, where are you comfortable? And if you want to make a meaningful uh, contribution, you can go, you know, community work, community development. And I'm not sure if a lot of students are aware about free courses that are being offered by United Nations with the sustainable development. Um, there are quite a lot of free courses that are being offered. And it's for us as South Africans to tap into it. When you go out there, I remember taking some youth to United Nations, it was a, a, a UN model on debate, and they had to do South Africa they had to do the model around Russia. When I took them to UN, there were young ones and people from all over Africa except South Africans. Because we don't reach out. I don't know whether our country is too beautiful, we are too comfortable, we don't want to go out there and get more information. Opportunities are there. And then if you want to be assisted, we are available you know, to assist you. We are available to mentor you. And those that amongst you are social workers, SAPSA is now up and running where we want to mentor the young ones. Uh, a year ago, we had to reskill uh, unemployed social workers in terms of you know, tra trauma counseling and debriefing, preparing them for the aftermath of COVID. Because we knew that COVID was going to, um, it, there was going to be havoc. But even now, people have never got an opportunity of being debriefed. Uh, the society is bruised. So they need people that can be assisted. And we are making inroads because now social workers are employed in schools. So there's a lot of work that is out there for, for, for all, of, all of us. I think let me pause and, and wait for, for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Eunice Maluleke, uh, for the wonderful presentation that you've given us. Um, allow me to take this opportunity and uh, ask if there is any question from our students. Uh, the questions will be going to both um, uh, Chris Salda, Kekana, and Ms. Maluleke, Eunice. Uh, I'll hand over to the students. Oh, yeah. It will go to Chris and I'll I'm doing media studies. Oh, I am Nova Zimaba, so I'm doing my final year, media studies. So I would love to know what gave you the courage to continue, because this was not the cause I wanted, but then now I fell in love with the cause, so, and you also did the same. What gave you the courage to do so? Oh, um... I think, well, first I'll be honest and say I don't come from a well-off family. And I mean, I was put through school basically by NSFAS. And I have, well, I'm an orphan and I have two younger sisters. So that, I'll be honest and say, was my initial reason to, look, I was already here. I was already studying this and I was in. I had no time to waste because in my head, I wanted to finish very quickly and get into the job space as soon as I can and have some income and help out at home. So that was my first thing. But secondly, I knew that I can always work with what I have. If I have a BA in media studies, I'll apply for every internship I'll get and in, I'll get a job. And when I'm settled, when things get better, because things always get better, when things get better, I'll reevaluate my life and I'll rechase my dream of being a lawyer or I'll, you know, reskill, get additional skills or go into another field. So I think it, 
wasn't really courage as much as it was me being realistic with my situation and faith. Um, I'm a Christian. I may have not mentioned that. So I believe in God and I knew that he would not put me where I should not be. So I took what I had and I just ran with it. And I think that kind of applies in everything, even after you get, you know, school is done. And for other people, it takes longer. I mean, I, I was lucky that I, I, I got you know, my internship as soon as I was done with school. But my best friend who was in the same class, she went two years without a job, but she is now working, you know, as a media liaison in a recycling company. So there's always something. Sometimes it takes longer, but if you have what you have and you keep pushing, doing the best that you can, things fall into place. So I don't think it was courage. I think it was um, perseverance more and faith. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Hello. Uh, my name is Mohadi Malimela, and my question will be directed to uh, Chriselda. Uh, I want to know what are the committees that uh, journalists need to uh, jo need to join in order to protect them to report freely without uh, without a fear. Um. Okay, so firstly, you have a constitutional right that gives you freedom of expression um, to report without fear, right? But obviously, as you will know, as a media student or as a journalism student, there are um, you know, regulations in place to make sure that what you report is not harmful to others or to yourself. Uh, SANEF, um, for example, exists. We have um, the press ombudsman, but all those are not necessarily what they don't give you, you. You don't have to wait for them to tell you, go and report. That is an inherent right that you have. A person who's not a journalist also has that right. It's, it's part of the freedom of expression, which I'm sure you, you would have done a lot by now. I think I did it in every year when I was studying. But you have that right. And when you report, depending on what you report, say it's a dangerous story or you're revealing, you know, corruption and that there isn't like, it's not like in the movies where there's like witness protection or whatever. It's really up to, if you're report, reporting for a newspaper, the newspaper that you're working for has to be able to protect you in terms of if you get sued um, or if your life is threatened in one way or another. So it's it's not really an organization. And unfortunately, in the media space, we don't even have like, um, you know, unions. Uh, they are there, but they are not prominent enough or uh, maybe persistent enough in protecting the rights of journalists. Hence, there is a very high chance of exploitation because the regulatory part of the industry is not where it should be. And that's unfortunate, but as a journalist, when you are working, or if you have a blog for, for, for um, you know, for an example, and it, you are the one maybe, you know, unveiling truth or something or, or exposing, you know, corruption or whatever the case may be, your protection essentially first is the constitution. There are organizations that are meant to protect you. However, if it's life threatening and you don't have some kind of backup, it's better to maybe consult. You, you, you can always ask the police for help, not sure which department, but they are supposed to be able to help you if you feel like your life has been threatened. However, I would say it's usually better if you're doing stories that are dangerous to maybe do it with another person for sake of protection. And I mean, there isn't like an organization where you put in your name and if somebody's chasing after you, they'll come and save you. It's just a matter of, you need to have a little bit of self-preservation as a journalist to know that I'm walking into this space and it's a potentially dangerous space, have plan B and plan C of, this is how I will deal with it, should it spin out this way? Because I mean, as much as you are dedicated to 
giving the public the news they deserve or the exposés or the truth, as is most often the case, you don't want to lose your life doing that, you know, it, so you have to have a little bit of self-preservation, but there are organizations just not in your face, I guess, not not organizations that will be like, yeah, if they call you and they're stalking you, then we're coming for them. I mean, as a journalist, I've been attacked for stories that I've written. Just recent, just last week, I was trolled on, on social media um, for, for a story that I did saying, for an opinion piece that I wrote saying, you know, that some men are abusive in what they say and they they are slanting and 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 uh, you know um degrading black women and i was attacked by that but nobody really protects you from that so there's also a little bit of you need to have a thick skin you need to go into it aware that this is a potentially dangerous space i'm going to trigger people i'm going to make some people mad um uh, there might be people that want to come for me and if you know that you cannot deal with it maybe that's not your space to be in um but i mean everything you can grow a skill it's it's like muscles the more you exercise the more your muscles grow so yeah i i think that's the best way i can answer you because there isn't really an organization where you sign up your name and they're like we got you for life so yeah Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, um, DJ Manzini. And I would like to appreciate um, Ms. Malibu Maluleke and Chriselda for uh, the inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, first question to Chriselda. What kind of um, an advice can you give to a, a newly emerging a woman journalist? Who is just um, who is just maybe graduated? Want to go far in journalism? Uh, number two, that's it goes to Miss um, Maluleke. Uh, normally, when you're new in in the field, you sometimes get embarrassed. Uh, let's say you're supposed to interview the public figure or you're supposed to interview the politicians and you've drawn down your the list of questions. Let's say there are five and say, okay, this is question number one, you ask. Then the person will go on and on and on to answer almost four of them in your list. What kind of creative strategies that you can give to... Um, a University of Limpopo student who want to go further in journalism in that manner. Uh, the second question, you spoke about uh, the free courses offered by the United um, Nations. Um, maybe you can elaborate m a bit more about that so that we can uh, take it into consideration. Thank you so much. Um, if it's okay, I'll just start so that you can Mama Luleke. Um, ooh, I, this question is a bit um, packed for me because before you are even a journalist, right, before I even advise you as a journalist, the fact that you are a woman and you are black adds to your journey challenges that other people may not experience. Um, and it's, what I would say is for yourself, you have to recognize and know, no matter how unfortunate it is, that there are certain privileges, whether people realize them or not, that they have. Like a man will get respect just for walking into a room before you know what he does or what he's about. but that respect may not necessarily be afforded to a woman. Um, a white man gets even more than that because he walks into a room and he could be the janitor in the building, but people will assume that he is the speaker. He is the one that has the information. And you're going to deal with that in different instances, micro, sometimes big, sometimes in your face, 
sometimes hidden where you will walk into a room and people will underestimate you. You will walk into a room and people will assume that you don't know what you're doing. That, you know, you, you'll you tell people I'm educated in this and that and they'll want proof from you and not want proof from your white counterpart. Those things, unfortunate, but they are real and they happen. So more than giving advice to a black, you know, gifted journalist that is going into journalism is that it's not even only in journalism it's in all spaces because unfortunately we live in a world that is exactly like that society has been built to be to be like that what you have to do is build yourself up is make a fortress for yourself by having confidence in who you are and in what you have studied you are not spending three years in an institution to get a paper you the experience from first to third year what you learn in class and out of class everything that happens to you in that time span some of us even everything that happens for, to you from high school the experiences build you up to be a woman who's going to get into that space and do the best that you are capable of doing and i think i i have found and as an entertainment journalist, even in the newsroom, you'll find like uh, uh, people that write politics will be like, ah, what are they writing anyway? Who are these people that they're writing about? It's not important. It's not part of the national dialogue, whatever that they say. And what I've realized is that in anything and in everything, in every space, be it social work, be it law, you're going to enter and you're going to have people that doubt you. And the only thing that's going to stand by you is your work. You have to have work ethic and that will outlive a lot of things. People have talent. Some of them have beauty. Some of them enter because of favor. You're going to enter because you know what you're doing. And the more you keep doing that, people won't have anything else to say because they may want to say, oh, but she's a black woman. What does she know? And then there are your stories on the front page of Sunday Times. So what the hell are you saying now? You know, so you let the work do the talking for you. I think that will stand you you know in good stead um no matter where you are yeah i'm gonna pass over to um mama Lulek. i guess mine was around the uh, united nations isn't it um when you when you go through the site the un you know site you it has quite a number of i you know icon where you can click in terms of the the free courses that they offer in terms of the job jobs that they offer uh in terms of the internships and whatever yesterday i was just looking at it and i've just registered today i received 20 vacancies united nations here in Tuan in pretoria so it will give you all that information that you require in terms of the courses that you can do and there's another another one um, where a lot of local people, you remember when it comes to other countries, you can offer them English. So as long as you've got a degree, there's a course that you can do to offer English online. And that's how people do their work, because if you don't have a job, what else can you do? So it's what we call e-learning. So I'm saying that you just Google. Even Harvard, you do the same thing. They've got free courses, and what you pay for is your certificate. So I'm saying use the net, save the net, get the information, and you go places. DTI, there are quite a number of opportunities as well where they, they do the facilitation courses, you know, they do the moderation courses and whatever. Yours is just to save the net, get the information, go for it. Thank you. I think I've answered all that. That was it, isn't it? Yes, it is, ma'am. I think just in addition to that, also LinkedIn um, has free courses, a lot of them short courses that will help you understand things better, like uh, what is search engine optimization and what's the difference between a journalist and a copywriter. LinkedIn has a lot of free courses as well. Um, and also following platforms like Biz Community, they always have job vacancies in addition to articles written by experts in their field. 
different experts. You lawyers will look for lawyers. You know, people in journalism will look for people, uh, 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 columnists that are writing about the industry. So it's really what she's saying that you need to take advantage of the internet. Yeah. Ladies, thank you very much. This was a very uh, fruitful tiaka with you, alumni of the University of Limpopo within the Faculty of Humanities. We have learned a lot, the students have learned a lot, and we surely will be uh, uh, sending this to a lot of students later on next week where they are going to really learn and uh, enrich themselves, especially those who think that they are unemployed and their lives are doomed. Tiaka with my faculty alumni and uh, led by the SRC Gender Health and Wellness. Thank you for your time. Any parting message? Two minutes, each one of you. I think since I started, let me say bye first. Um, Parting message is you need to be yourself and let your work speak for you. And you can't let your work speak for you if you don't practice and make it perfect. Even today, after I've been writing for however long I've been writing, I don't even know the years now, I still read books about how to write better. I still follow TED Talks about how to engage the audience better. Um, the, you always need to be upskilling yourself and at the same time it's it's also you, you need to care for yourself as a, a person as a woman as a human being when your body needs to rest rest when you need to eat eat it's no use getting the degree if you're going to die because you are not taking care of yourself so let's take care of ourselves and whatever space you get in let them just fill you with your work i think those are my parting words yeah Thank you for having me. I, th I think your, your destiny is trapped inside of you. It is your responsibility to realize your purpose. And there's no one who can do that for you except yourself. There, there, there was this notion uh, when it comes to I forgot the religion, what they call it. The ones that are worshipping these moments and what have you. They, they had a, you know, a clay statue. And they've been praying for this clay statue for quite a number of years. And because of development will always take place, they had to relocate the statue to take it to another place. And what happened was that, you know, as they were moving this statue, you know, the, the, the clay started to peel off and inside that statue, it was gold. And I'm saying to all of us that there is gold that is trapped inside of us. Until we shake it off, take off the clay, we are not going to realize that we've got gold inside of us. So the, let the sky not be the limit. Roll out your sleeves and work as much as you can. And it is beautiful when you're young that you go out of your way and work and empower yourself so that when the time comes then you are able to enjoy the fruit of your of your work all the best Ihidwe and the team we are available to assist in whatever way that will require of us because we are part of the institution and therefore we need to impart our skills and thank you Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you for plowing back using your resources, which are your time, the data that you've been using today. We are truly grateful to that. May you and Chriselda be blessed beyond that which you think deserve from God. May your source of life bless you and uh, keep you and also grow, continue to grow you into the people that you ought to be in order to make the change that you are meant to make for the students at the University of Limpopo, for your communities where you are, and for the world at large. I'll give over to 
Miriam Mabocha, and please know that we are going to be keeping in touch uh, with you, with Criselda. The students will uh, be encouraged to communicate with you in however comfortable way you will uh, be uh, affording us. Over to Miriam Mabocha. Yeah, sorry, um, Kihilwe. I will forward you some of the links now. Yes, yes, I will, I will forward you some of the links for United Nations so that you know they don't struggle that much. Thank so, you. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you, sis, uh, sis Eunice. Okay. okay, you are always there to assess the alumni office, whichever way you can. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Saski Hilu, and thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. Eunice Marileke and Chriselda Kekana for honoring the call when we called as the University of Limpopo SRC that uh, can you come and please um, inspire confidence in our female students. You took your time away from your families, away from your jobs and um, indeed I believe that after this uh, moment our female students would know what to do and their ways around um, their choices of uh, their career choices. Thank you, and thank you once again. Bye bye, Sis Yunus. I'll keep in touch. Oh, okay, bye bye, bye bye, ma'am.